Well, we're jumping ahead this, this morning uh, several hundred years uh, to the time of Thomas Aquinas, so this, we're jumping to the 1200s. But there's some very interesting things that happen along the way, mainly having to do with the tension, and we're, we're dealing with the Eucharist and the meaning of the Eucharist in the Latin tradition, because the Greek tradition is a very different thing, actually, oops, um, which would be interesting to look at, but it doesn't inform, for instance, uh, the Book of Common Prayer, which is one of the focal points, sort of our landing point for this uh, series. Uh, and, and we can already see then there are two major trajectories coming out of the Latin tradition from the patristic period, from the early church. One is represented by Ambrose of Milan uh, and is most representatively said in uh, that little quote from the Christian faith that I had in the reading. Now we, as often as we receive the sacramental elements, which by the mysterious efficacy of holy prayer are transformed or transfigured into the flesh and the blood, do show forth the Lord's death. And then he says in another text, in that sacrament, the Eucharist, is Christ. So Christ is in the sacrament because it is the body of Christ. Right? So the focus is on the transformation of the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. And so that Christ is, in, is quite seriously in the bread and the wine. Augustine, on the other hand, who was baptized by Ambrose and converted by his preaching, Augustine of Hippo has a very different take on the Eucharist. And this is going to cause trouble all the way through the Western tradition, right? You have these two different views. For Augustine, the most memorable line, and it comes up, it'll show up in Luther. So um, the most memorable line, it shows up actually in, the, in Gratian's Canon Law, which was formulated in the 1100s. Um, to what purpose do you make ready teeth and stomach? believe, and you have already eaten. And he says, uh, wherefore the Lord about to give the Holy Spirit said that he himself was the bread that came down from heaven, exhorting us to believe on him. For to believe on him is to eat the living bread. Uh, and then later on in his commentary, or his sermons on John, this then is the bread that cometh down from heaven, that if any man eats thereof, he shall not die. But this is what belongs to the virtue of the sacrament, not to the visible sacrament. So he makes this distinction between the reality or the power of the sacrament and the sacrament itself. Uh, he, he that eats within, not without, who eats in his heart, not who presses with his teeth. Right. So, so real eating of the body and blood of Christ is to eat with your heart, not with your mouth. And it's to believe and not to press with your teeth. He, he really doesn't like this pressing with the teeth idea. So, um, so it's interesting that you have two of the major Latin theologians don't agree on this topic, really. Uh, and, and that disagreement will take a while to emerge. Uh, it, it actually takes 500 years to emerge. But 500 years after they both formulate their positions in the 800s, at the same monastery, now we have Benedictine monasticism arising, in the monastery of Corby, there are two theologians, monks, but there are a lot of theologians at this period uh, came out. Well, all theologians came out of the monastery by now. So in the early church, theologians were bishops. In the medieval church, they're by and large monks, interestingly. Um, and then we'll see a transition when we get to Aquinas. There was a debate in the 800s about this very question, right? What's the nature of the Eucharist, especially the presence of the body and blood of Christ? And Rod Paradis of Corby said, very uh, much following Ambrose, that the bread becomes the body that was born of the Virgin Mary and that was crucified. Uh, and they really intensified this idea of this is the body of Jesus that was born and crucified. Um, and so that really is the, kind of the Ambrose trajectory being represented at Corby. Rat Primus of Corby says that the bread, um, the bread remains bread but there's a spiritual presence of Christ being communicated to us in the Eucharist, which would be much more. And he's, of course, citing Augustine there. You eat with your heart. You don't press with your teeth kind of thing. And this, they play to a draw. No one's condemned. But it, it reintroduces in the 800s this early and focuses a light on the fact that Augustine and Ambrose didn't agree on this question, which is never, uh, you know, that's never a good idea to have two, two of your major teachers uh, disagree about an issue. But, it, but it's interesting that it took that long, 800 years, for there to be an argument about the Eucharist. In the Eastern Church, there's never an argument about the Eucharist, right? So that there's something unstable in the Western Church, I guess, that leads us to have arguments about this. 
the, the situation gets more intense, and we'll see that Aquinas referring to this, uh, in the 1050s in France, a fellow named Berengarius of Tours um, supported Rob Thomas's view, which was the, the Augustan view, right? And so why do you press with your, why do you prepare your teeth and tongue, believe and you have eaten? And so the, the, the body of Christ is a spiritual reality and we commune by faith and especially by love and not by pressing with the teeth. You can imagine he thought he was pretty well covered since he's working from Augusta, right? But he was opposed by Anselm's great teacher, Lanfranc, uh, around the 1050s, and he was accused of heresy for teaching this. So you can see the Western church pretty much in its liturgical and sacramental practice, without really arguing about it, sided very strongly with an Ambrose-like interpretation of the meaning of the Eucharist. And so by the time you get to Berengarius in the 10 hundreds, He's a heretic now for teaching this. No one said that Red Promise was a heretic in the 800s, but now Berengarius is a heretic. And so he was made Berengarius, poor guy. Berengarius was forced to make a number of recantations. He was condemned in several different councils, and he recanted, and then he recanted his recantation, and then he recanted again, and recanted his recantation. And so he, he, was, made to, he was made to state these outrageous things, especially I, Berengarius, believe that when I consume the Eucharist, I'm consuming the crucified body of Christ, the body that was crucified. And even the later tradition, like Aquinas, doesn't want to go that far, right? So they, they were really pushing him to this, almost what Augustine would call a carnal presence, but what the opponents of Berengarius would call the real presence, right? He's making the real presence of Christ into a Gnostic thing. It just only appeared to be flesh, but you're not, it wasn't really flesh, right? The, the flesh of Christ. So, so there, the two sides were very much developing into a polarization here, um, which continues actually right through the Reformation, probably continues to this day. So um, I love it, though, that he recanted, and then he recanted this recantation, and then he recanted that again, and then he went back and forth. So we're never quite sure actually where he wound up. Uh, he went off into solitude uh, and quit writing, so I okay, don't blame him, but... Uh, um, we're not quite sure what, what his actual position was at the end. Another thing that happens around exactly the same time is this guy Hildebert of Tours, who was a, obviously a colleague of Berengarius's, he coined the term transubstantiation, right? So it's not transfiguration the way it was in Ambrose. He coins the term transfiguration. And so um, in the 1200s, all sorts of things happen in the 1200s. It's an incredibly dynamic time in the Western church. Um, one of the things they want to solve in the 1200s at a council called by the Pope, Innocent III, is this whole question. Because again, it's a very divisive issue. You know, you have communion, which is a symbol of unity and love, and people are arguing about it and condemning each other. And so they wanted to have, oops, Hold on, I just have to admit people in the waiting room, sorry. Um, they wanted to have consensus on this. And the Pope was also trying to show that Pope, the Pope had the authority to call a council, right? And so um, this is, become, becomes very controversial with the Eastern Church because for the Eastern Church, only the emperor could call an ecumenical council. And now the Pope is calling an ecumenical council. So this is already creating problems with the Eastern Church. And as we'll see, this council also causes trouble in the Western Church. But at the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215, this question of the, of the nature of the Eucharist was decided. And so if you're a Roman Catholic, this is your position to this day, right? So it has it's, uh, remained settled pretty much for uh, the last uh, thousand plus, or about a thousand years. <clears throat> so looking at the, at the reading, the very first uh, paragraph is for Canon 1 of the Fourth Lateran Council. And so you can see, since it's the very first, and Canons, by the way, in conciliar documents, the authoritative statements are made in canons, and there's always an affirmation of the truth and a condemnation of the falsehood that's being condemned. The, the interesting thing, I raised that because Vatican II has no canons, right? Vatican II, Vatican I had all sorts of canons. Vatican II intentionally had no canons because uh, Pope Paul said, uh, or I'm sorry, Pope John, Pope John said, enough condemnations. This council is not about condemning things, it's about opening to the world. So it's a very, but that means that Vatican II 
can be highly disputed because there are no, there are no canons in there. But anyway, uh, that's just a detail. But you can see canon one, they want to get right away to this issue. There is one universal church of the faithful outside of which there is absolutely no salvation. That's a pretty strong statement right there. Oh, <laughs> yeah, what do they mean by universal church there? Catholic. Catholic. Yeah, so when you say, I believe in one holy Catholic and I'm a Catholic church, Catholic means universal. So there's only not, not Roman Catholic. No, the Roman Catholic doesn't come into parlance until uh, the Reformation, right? Because, uh, because there are three, by the end of the Reformation, there are three contenders for the Catholic church, according to the empire anyway. There's the Lutheran, the Reformed, and the Roman Catholic, and the Roman and so the Roman Catholic then becomes... And how, is, it, how is the Orthodox thing? Yeah, how is, it, it, so, how is the Orthodox? Orthodox church. Oh, they're, they're out. Oh, they're because the one church is under the leadership of the Pope. Okay. And so they actually said at one point, uh, one of the Popes said, made this claim that there's only one uh, church and the Pope is the head of it, and anyone who does not obey the Pope is out. And the Eastern Church said... Well, we're the church, and they said, no, actually not, you're heretics. In fact, there was a, there was a horrible event in Constantinople. Uh, Constantinople was attacked by the Crusaders and, and pillaged, and all of the many, many of the wonderful works of art in the church and everything wound up in, in Venice. Right? So if you love Venetian art and stuff, it came from Constantinople when they pillaged it. And there were Christians, Orthodox Christians in Constantinople, obviously, and they were hanging banners out of the window saying, no, no, we're not, not Muslims, we're Christian. And they're like, no, you're not, because you don't obey the Pope. Right, so the one Catholic church out of the faithful outside of which there's absolutely no salvation is the Church of Innocent III. But and the, the, the Catholics still don't believe it. Oh, yes, you can't not believe it, because it's in a canon of the so Orthodox. Say the Orthodox are not. Well, this is a matter, this is where the Orthodox Catholic dialogue is very touchy. Right? So, yeah, Dave? Isn't, that, isn't this why it was so significant about rapprochement between um, John Paul, um, that it, the calling the um, church breeds with two lines? Right. The east and the west of the Right, no, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was John Paul II, right? Yes. yes the church agrees with two lungs, and, but that's not, a, there's been no, I mean, the, and the people who are the touchiest about this are the Eastern Orthodox, right? They're very, first of all, very condescending about Latin. They think it's a very inferior language compared to Greek. Oh, um, and secondly, they're really hurt by the move that the popes made away from the conciliar consensus of the earlier centuries. I mean, it really is pretty amazing to go from the second seven ecumenical councils called by emperors, which is already weird. I mean, you have to admit, that's a weird thing. No, there's no ecumenical Christian council if the emperor doesn't call it. <laughs> so anyway, but that's the orthodox view. And for the Pope then to start calling ecumenical councils, including Vatican II, is just performing over and over again what really offends uh, Eastern theology. Yeah. There's also the Loki and some Oh, yeah, that's really all the way, right. Yeah, so Augustine teaches, of the, and if for those of you who stick around for the Trinity next uh, in our next forum series, uh, Augustine said that the, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, whereas uh, the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople said that the, the Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, but it doesn't proceed from the Son. That was to distinguish between them. And so the Pope adds this phrase, which is still in our... Confession in our uh, Nicene Creed, when we say that in church, proceeds from the Father and the Son. They said, "Well, how do you have? How do you possibly have the right to change an ecumenical council from 381? You just add your own insertion." So it's because the Pope is seen to have, in his own person, conciliar authority. Right. So there are things that the Pope can, the Pope can actually promulgate Catholic dogma without a council meeting. Oh. And that virtually happens with the uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary in the 1800s. He promulgates that. He consulted with people, but he promulgates that under his own authority. But that's already what's going on here. So in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth Lateran councils and the Council of Trent, they're meeting under the authority of the Pope, right? And the Pope is the one who promulgates the dogma. So, for instance, Paul VI promulgated Vatican II. It didn't have any authority until he did Right, and, that, and then the Pope started to argue about how to receive Vatican II. But Vatican II, as I said, is already an interesting thing because it does not have as much authority as Vatican I. 
But yeah, so there have been there have been attempts by the Roman side, impressive attempts actually to overcome this. But the Eastern side, at least from even my Eastern Orthodox theologian friends, they're really they're still very wary of, of the West. And for good reasons, there have been a lot of things that the West did, including sacking Constantinople back during the Crusades that were really unfortunate. Yeah. One just clarifying. When we're talking Eastern Orthodox, we're talking Russian, Greek, Syrian, <clears throat> Coptic, the whole No, we're talking this is a good question. Uh, yeah. Eastern Orthodox are the are Russian and Greek in particular, and they're very much aligned with the state and often the military, interestingly, yeah. uh, especially in Greece. So but also in Russia. Um, so yes, or Ukrainian Orthodox would be another one. And there's Ukrainian Catholic too. Um, but yes, we're talking about, but you're not talking about Syriac because they're non-imperial. If you meet, uh, if you meet people who have, who come from Semitic Christianity, like Coptic Christianity, they are very much against the whole bunch of us because we all went to bed with Constantine and we became imperial. Right. And so they would view the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran, whatever, and also then the Orthodox as imperial. And they're not gen and also they would have the wrong language because Jesus spoke Aramaic. He was Semitic and they're still Semitic and we're not. So so the thought of the Orthodox and Greek is the highest. Even the Russian Orthodox would concede that Greek is the, the language of the church. Right. Uh, and they would say absolutely not. I mean, Greek, Jesus didn't speak Greek. Right, so there's a long, long division in the church. So, and if you meet somebody from what they would call the non-imperial churches, they're really, they're really upset at how they get ignored, and they're just kind of an afterthought. Whereas they view themselves as the real bearers of the tradition. I mean, in a lot of ways, the sacking of Jerusalem by Rome was a tragedy because for Jerusalem was the mother church, right? And then once Jerusalem's no longer the center of that way, you move to Greek and Latin very quickly. And, uh, and so that whole Semitic grounding of the church go, goes away for much of the world, not obviously not for those traditions. And so yeah, it's a good, it's a good question, right? And it's Coptic. A, and Coptic, yeah, Cop, Coptic is still here, right? It's in mainly in Egypt. And there's a Coptic pope, and he actually resided, he, I've met him, I met him, he was blind. Well, he passed away. The one I met him passed away, but he was blind, but I met him at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Um, which was really moving, actually. So, yeah, there, the, the, these different traditions. The Christendom has not been united from the very beginning. So the Reformation did not start the division. <laughs> the division starts much earlier than that. Um, so anyway, so yes, I do mean, and the Catholic Church still teaches this, that outside the church there is absolutely no salvation. And then, of course, how do you interpret that becomes the question. <laughs> In which it's true. That's what theology does, right? We paint ourselves into a box and then we try to find a way out of it. <laughs> but anyway. In which there is the same priest and sacrifice, Jesus Christ, whose body and blood are truly contained in the sacrament of the altar. So you see that language of in that you saw in Ambrose under the forms of bread and wine. And then uh, this becomes the definition, the bread being changed or transubstantiated by divine power into the body and the wine into the blood. So that to realize the mystery of unity, we may receive of him what he has received of us. In other words, he receives humanity from us and then we receive it back from him. And this sacrament, no one can effect except the priest who has been duly ordained in accordance with the keys of the church, which Jesus Christ himself gave to the apostles and their successors when they're citing the gospel of John in particular, receive when Christ reads on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit, that gives them the authority to effect this sacrament. So you see several things happening there that are really important. Uh, and they, they raise an issue that we hadn't really seen before about the priest and the sacrifice. Right now, the early church did call the Eucharist the sacrifice, but if you notice, neither Ambrose nor Augustine, when they're talking about it straight up, really use that language. But it was present in the early church, I'm not disputing that. Mainly a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Um, just want to make sure I'm not missing. Oh, um, sorry, <laughs> this is over at the side, so I can't see who's waiting in the room. Uh, mainly a sacrifice of Thanksgiving, but even this is argued about today, what they, what they meant by that. But the, but the documents we looked at were pretty representative, did not emphasize the nature of the, of the sacrament as a sacrifice. But you can see right out of the gate, Christ is the one priest and the one sacrifice, uh, and that's going to be a very important theme, as we'll see. And then, whose, whose body and blood are truly contained in 
That's not, Augustine would not want anything contained in. For, Christ, for Augustine, Christ has ascended to heaven. So you can't, the Copernites, he thought, Augustine thought, thought Christ was contained in the bread, and that's why they were offended. Um, so anyway, that, that's a very strong statement, uh, that the bread being changed or transubstantiated by divine power into the body and the wine into the blood. This is still the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, right? So everything that follows is simply an elaboration of this doctrine, but it can't be changed. Um, so, uh, so that's in 1215. Um, and that was the attempt to end the, the sacramental controversy. What happens, ironically, and this often is the case, is that this definition then becomes the source of a whole new controversy the last few centuries, right? So including how does the Pope have the authority to teach a doctrine that is not in Scripture? That's going to be one of the arguments. And then the other is, uh, really? <laughs> the, the, this has been the, trend, the substance of the bread and wine are not the body and blood of Christ. That's going to be another one. So you have kind of a, a philosophical question. Can, the, can you have a substance that still looks like bread that's really the body of Christ? And then the other question is, who's, under whose authority is this doctrine being taught? Uh, and, the, and the reaction to it happens pretty quickly. But Thomas Aquinas... It is one of the major, well, probably the major interpreter of this doctrine. Um, a lot of people call it Thomas's doctrine, but it's not. He's simply interpreting uh, the Fourth Lateran Council. And Thomas is a very interesting person himself in that he, he lives during a period of tremendous change in, what, in the Western church. But first of all, you have the four, things like the Fourth Lateran Council, which also, by the way, later on teaches you must receive communion once a year to be in good standing, and you must confess your sins once a year to a priest to be in good standing. And the season of Lent then becomes this time of preparation for your one confession and your one communion. And so Lent becomes a kind of corporate penitential period, whereas it used to be a period of penance and, and, and catechesis for those about to be baptized. Uh, it then became a real preparation for you and fasting and things like that to prepare for your one confession and your one communion would usually be an Easter vigil. Um, and you'd fast in between. So you'd confess and then you'd fast the whole time and then you'd receive communion. What? Yes. Is this the time when they, I know the Catholic Church usually just gives the bread in communion, but is it after, is Easter, do they serve wine as well? I know they I do. do. I think it's right around the period where they withhold the cup. And mainly because if it's really the blood of Christ, in churches of this time, they, they didn't have pews. Actually, Calvin invents pews. He brings pews into the church. And then they immediately start to argue about who gets to sit where, right? And if you can buy a pew and all that stuff, um, which still goes on. And you, if you go to the church in Arlington, Virginia, where George Washington and, Washington and Robert E. Lee worshipped, they had their own pews. So this became a kind of practiced online, I'm sure, at St. James. There were family pews, right? You know it because you see the brass plaques, right? So um, anyway, because of that, churches, people just wandered in and out of churches. In fact, even in the Reformation, Calvin says, there's some people who are really good uh, preachers in terms of their writing, but their voices are really horrible. Like there was one I heard who, when he preached, the dog started to howl. <laughs> and I'm like, the dog started to howl? Well, there are dogs in church, right? So the church during communion was very hustly bustly, people coming in and out, and going around. And so if you have the one, the chalice, you want to be extremely careful and we get jostled. And then when you spill it on the floor, what are you supposed to do? It's a nightmare. It's a, it's a total nightmare. No, I know, right? I've seen, I've seen priests almost have. Yeah. <laughs> No, they'll, they'll have a heart attack. It's yeah. a major thing. Yeah, it's a huge thing, right? And it's also then, what do you do when you clean the chalice? When the altar girl cleans the chalice, where does the water go? It's not supposed to go in the sewer, but it goes out into the ground. I mean, there's a whole elaborate... When I, was, when I grew up, I grew up in an evangelical Episcopal church, and yet they had their sacristy had all of that in it. So um, anyway, so yeah, the... the um, the withholding of the cup was so that you don't spill the blood of Christ accidentally. And uh, I mean, I have Catholic friends who go to Protestant, they don't take communion or Protestant services, but they look up at the altar rail and there are all these crumbs and there's all this wine spilled and people with intention dripping things up and they just have a stroke. They're like, well, thank God you don't really have communion because your priests aren't ordained by Catholic bishops, right? Otherwise, you're just spilling wine and bread, but otherwise you'd be dropping the body and blood of Christ all over the place. So I'm really serious. 
So when you receive communion, oftentimes it doesn't happen anymore, but they used to hold a paten under your chin. And the priest would put the host directly, and there wasn't bread because you don't want crumbs all over the place. I'm really serious. You want, and they place it directly on your tongue, and the last thing you do is chew it. You don't chew it. Again, they sort of pick up Augustine. You don't press it with your teeth. You let it dissolve, right? Because it's sacred, and you don't eat it like put gum. You know, it's like, <laughs> that was really, or this kind of sale, things like this. So, so the, the pattern being under the chin also protects against any sort of accidental dropping. The fact that it's a wafer and not bread protects against crumbs all over the place, which would be a huge problem. And then uh, withholding the cup uh, prevents wine from being spilled. And the church still claims the authority to withhold the cup. So it, it, it offers the cup at times now after Vatican II, but also can withhold it. Yeah, can, that's how they do it St. Thomas' well, Church Episcopal in New York City. They you, try you. to receive communion like we receive communion here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they would have a stroll, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, in the Episcopal Church of the Anglican tradition, there, well, you know this, right? There's high church sort of Oxford movement, things are very, they probably go past what Roman Catholics do today. And then there's very low church um, as well. So, but even in my low church upbringing, they were very serious about communion and, and about, um, you know, the priest, if there's any wine left in the chalice, the priest finishes all of it, which on a hot Sunday could be really, really tough. So if you notice here, people are pretty careful not to overload the chalice. But when I grew up, they'd overload the chalice, and so the priest would wind up drinking the rest of it. Yes? At what point, uh, for those who believe in transubstantiation, does the transferring occur? Oh, it's at the prayer of consecration. Point the bread and the wine. Yeah, so the bread and wine, that's a good question. So when does, when does transubstantiation occur? Um, that's going to be our newly baptized, by the way, which is going to be really cool. So that's why um, David warned me that we're coming through, or alerted me to warn me. But anyway, that's going to be really neat at 1030. Um, but yeah, so, so that's a really good question. So only the priests can do this. So you have to be ordained by a Catholic bishop. And uh, it's when the words of institution are said over the bread and the wine. Take eat, this is my body, drink you all of this, this is my blood. When that happens with the authority of the priest, that's when this change happens. And from that point on, if you've ever been to a mass, the priest never touches anything else. And always has, you know, it looks very pious, but they'll have their fingers like this. It's not being pious because they have now transformed the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And so they themselves are changed by this. Uh, they're also the only ones who can hear and absolve sin, by the way. It doesn't occur when the bells tingle. Oh, no, that was the like, bells tingle. The bell, the christening bells is really interesting. Okay. So um because the body of the there's another thing, remind me about the, the anti-Judaism that erupts after this is really scary too. But um because the body and blood are now transformed, uh, the, the bread and wine are now transformed in the body and blood of Christ, although appearing to be bread and wine, people were terrified <laughs> to receive communion. That's why they tell them at Fourth Lateran, you have to receive communion at least once a year. At least once a year. I mean, that means people weren't even receiving it once a year. Why? Because you could, as, as um, Paul tells us, if you don't discern the body and blood of Christ, you eat your condemnation. You, eat, you bring judgment on yourself. And so even if you made a good confession, why would you want to receive communion? And so they, the thought arose, and I think it arose in the laity, and you can see why, that you could have ocular communion, right? Ocular communion was communion with your eyes. And so, and that was seen as being as good as sacramental communion, which is when you receive with your mouth. And so in order to alert the townspeople, I'm serious, that the body and blood of Christ had now been duly consecrated, uh, when the chalice and the host were going to be elevated, and which we still do, there's a very dramatic moment, right? They bring the christening bell so people can run in and see it. They didn't run in to participate, eating. They didn't run in to participate in the sacrament. They came in to commune ocularly, and they would even drill holes through the mortar at the back of the church so they could look through when the bells rang, look through and see the host being elevated, and that was their communion, right? And then they also started to adore the reserved host of the Eucharist, and that became a kind of spiritual communion as well. So, so there were all sorts of practices that developed because people were scared to death of the sacrament. 
right? Because it was just so, it was Christ. It's, he's in the sacrament. So, um, so that's a really good question. So we now do it. I don't think it's St. James that are ringing the bells for, um, remind me in 30 minutes, all sorts of things are happening behind me here. Um, I don't think they ring the bells because people are going to have ocular communion. It just sounds pretty. Right, and it adds sort of dignity. No, I'm serious. It adds a dignity to it, and it's kind of it's quite Catholic, small C. It's pretty liturgy, but we're ring, we're doing something that has nothing to do with what we're actually doing. But that happens in the church all the time, right? Things, the practices arise, and we keep doing them, even though the reason for the practice is no longer there. So, <laughs> it's tradition, exactly. And sometimes that's a good thing, and sometimes it's a crazy thing. It's just all the times. Yeah, yeah. I think sometimes it's a good thing. And one of the things, um, and this is not to do with the Eucharist, is the bowing to the cross as it comes down the aisle. I feel it's sad that people don't understand why then you know they're not doing it. It's an acknowledgement because the person carrying the cross is, in a sense, Christ among us. It isn't just someone carrying a cross. It's, it's in a sense, as Christ enters, comes down. The front. It's not literally that way, but it's representative. Represented. And people don't bow. And I think what we've lost is a sense that we are not equal to God. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know, we aren't. Right. And this cross represents something we are not we inherit it through Christ. Mm -hmm. We become God's children. And I feel in an age in which everybody thinks it's bad to bow to anything and have missed the whole point that they're bowing to people all the time in their minds. People who you work with, people who own your house, people, you know, we make accommodations in a sense all across the board. We won't bend in, in any way and say the thing to the cross. And I, I guess this isn't Eucharistic, but it does spill out into the Eucharist itself. Well, why aren't we meaning? Why aren't we bound? Why are we not acknowledging anything? Um, perhaps it's teaching, perhaps it's been lost, perhaps it's not worth it. I don't know. Yeah, no, I mean, but it's... I miss the right point <clears throat> is that the positions we take physically mm -hmm. have a, have a um, to look up and listen is different than looking down and reading. You know, you make a choice to how you're going to hear something. Mm -hmm. Not good or bad, not making a moral decision yet. But there's a difference between listening, reading, humbling yourself. There are differences in how you're hearing and receiving the word. Yeah. And I think this does go to the Eucharist. Oh, no, definitely. No, and this is what, what, what you're pointing out is, and this is in the Episcopal Church, there's a tremendous amount of variation on this. Like when I grew up, no one would think of bowing when the cross came in. And I was, a, I wore the cross, I was an act white. Uh, didn't wear sneakers either. They would have like, shot me if I had come to church with sneakers on, but uh, I still have that little voice in my head. What are they doing with sneakers? <laughs> anyway, um, we never bowed to the cross, right? So, we, so a lot of this, and we'll get to it, a lot of this has to do with the critique of idolatry that erupts in the Reformation, right? So you're bowing to an image. We're not to worship graven images. That's one of the top commandments of the Ten Commandments. That's, that would be the argument going the other way. Uh, the other is, I was always told it was that it comes from the Philippians, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And so, when the symbol of Christ goes by, you bow, right? Uh, but then you would say you would do that every time the name of Christ was mentioned. So, God forbid, if a sermon went on and mentioned Christ several times, you bow each time. Right? But there's something. But there's. I take your point. There's something reverent about that that we definitely we had the sense of reverence in our culture is out of the door, right? It's like how vulgar can you get is really uh, our trajectory these days. But in terms of why the practice is controverted, that's why. So um, whether you should even have the image of the cross, or it's, God forbid, a crucifix, or images of Mary or other things in the church, that's going to be a huge issue in the 16th century. And the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Church inherit all of those arguments and try to hold it together, right? So they've never made a decision, you have to do X, Y, or Z, because that would just ruin the whole thing. People would just leave, right? <laughs> but that means we also have people who do very contradictory things because of this Reformation heritage. So it's an excellent, it does have to do with the Eucharist. Like there are places you would never, when I received communion growing up, I knelt at the altar rail. Well, here we receive standing up, right? That would never have happened when I was a kid. My mother would have been horrified. It's like, why aren't you kneeling, right? How, do, how dare you stand when you receive this? So, so there are all sorts of bodily practices that go into this. You're absolutely right. Um, okay, one more, and then we, have to, we haven't got a Thomas yet. Before I miss, 
Oh, sorry. No, no. Oh, were you first? I'm sorry, I didn't see. I saw it. When, when, when I, I went to 12 years of Catholic school, and when I was in elementary school, I was told not to chew the Eucharist. Right. And I, I don't think I knew why, but I remember, you know, that. And I, so now I know why. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Right. No, it's, it's because, I mean, yeah. and, and again, it's a sign of reverence, right? You just let it develop because you're not supposed to chew it the way you're chewing the sandwich. That's a, and it's a way, a way to have a spiritualized oral eating, right? So it isn't just eating like something else. Yeah, that's why. Yes. In a church that's big with this many traditions, I didn't grow up. I grew up Southern Baptist. So uh -huh. I'm like, oh, I could think about bowing to that cross every time it comes by. So it's kind of uh, like I would I would love to actually know more about what bodily things I oh, wow. couldn't do. Um, but I've done a bad job of what just absorbing things as I worship. No, it's true. It's, and a lot of us aren't like cradle Episcopalians until we're learning by imitation, right? So we look around and say, like, oh, people are crossing themselves now. I don't know why. Oh, now they're crossing themselves differently. How are they doing that? So we don't talk about a lot of that uh, stuff, which is one reason I thought it'd be fun to do the Eucharist, right? Because it's something we participate in every week, if we come every week or at least every time we come. And yeah, we don't really explore it that much. So I thought it would be fun to to explore that too. So I agree with you. It's it's something we need to talk about more. And it's also something that about which there's no consensus even here. Like I don't think Father David or Mother Shannon or anyone would want to say this is how we do things here. I've been to Anglican churches that do that or high Episcopal churches that do that. And I, I find it much better here. I don't I don't want to get into all that stuff. It's micromanaging, right? But that means that there's a lot of passion behind a lot of these things. So it's really interesting. So Thomas Aquinas is in the 1200s as well. Um, he's part of a new order, the Order of Preachers. Uh, so you have the rise of what are called the Friars. You have the Order of Preachers, and then you also have the Franciscans, who are a little earlier out of the gate in the 1200s. Um, and Thomas' parents wanted him to become a Benedictine monk, and he wanted to become a Dominican. And they even lock him away for a year to change his mind, and he doesn't change his mind, and when they let him out, he becomes a Dominican. Um, Thomas Aquinas is, and this isn't only just something Roman Catholics would say, he's probably the most brilliant theologian of the Christian tradition. It is astonishing what this man was able to do, and he didn't live that long, if you look at his dates, 1225 to 1274. He wrote, he didn't finish it, but he wrote a massive summary of doctrine called the Summa Theologica, which is what the, the reading we're looking at this morning comes from. He also wrote one he did finish called the Summa Contra Gentiles, uh, which was given to Dominicans who were working in areas where the Muslims had been. And so they're dealing with Muslim criticisms of Christianity. Uh, and, and the man was incredible. At the height of his career, he was giving, he was writing commentaries on Aristotle, he was writing commentaries on scripture, and he was writing the Summa Theologica like virtually at the same time. Uh, and he, his scribe was just blown away, couldn't, couldn't keep up with him in terms of his um, work, work uh, product. <clears throat> the other thing that's interesting about this period is theology moves from the monastery into a uni the university start, right? University of Paris, Oxford University, Bologna is actually the first one. Um, and the theology moves into the university and it becomes what's called scholastic theology, which basically means school theology. And there are people who think that was a really good thing, and there are people who think that's a disaster. Monasteries, the theology never left the monastery in the Eastern Church, right? So all theology is born in the Eastern Church in the monastery. In Mount Athos, it is the monastery of monasteries that bears theology. And all bishops come out of monasteries in the Eastern Church. Priests don't have to, but bishops do. So, so the Eastern Church has preserved this monastic cradle, if you will, of theology, but the West theology went into the university. And Thomas is one of the first like, major university theologians of, of theology. The other thing that the early scholastic period tried to do was to harmonize a disharmonious tradition. So you can see already uh, with the Ambrose Augustine thing that on any given question, you could find a multitude of opinions in church tradition. So when people say, I believe what the tradition teaches, good luck. Because right? you'll believe a whole bunch of different things about exactly the same issue. So for instance, is the bread really to be eaten with the mouth and that's the body of Christ? Ambrose would probably say yes. Augustine would say, what are you kidding? 
right? So, um, so on any given question, including this one, there was a great amount of dispute. And so what the scholastics tried to do was create what they called dis disputed questions that they then resolved. So the, the theology was actually meant to resolve contradictions and to, to create harmony. What happens, of course, is scholastic theologians start arguing with each other about how they go about creating harmony, which leads to more disharmony. This is human life, right? So every solution becomes somebody else's problem. But Aquinas really, what, I mean, I think that's why his influence only grew over time, because he excelled at trying to do that. And he would give the position that he didn't like a better shot than the people who taught it gave it. Like, you, when you read him on why Christ can't be divine by nature, he convinces you, right? Whereas the Arians might not have. But Aquinas is like, oh my God, he gives them really good reasons. So when he, when he responds to the objections to every teaching, he's responding to positions that are really well represented. I mean, he re represents his opponent's positions well. But what he's trying to do, especially in his discussion of the Eucharist, is draw together all these different strands of the tradition and also then harmonize them with the Fourth Lateran Council, right? So, so the Fourth Lateran Council is now, and it's only been a few years since it was passed when he wrote this, um, but he now is going to make sure that transubstantiation becomes the central point of the Eucharist. But he's also going to include a whole lot of other things, and that's what makes him interesting. He's kind of a, an inventory of the state of the question in the 1200s. So the very first uh, quote I have there from Thomas, it, it's interesting, you can see just how differently they were thinking about the Eucharist during this period. This sacrament has a threefold significance, he says, one with regard to the past, inasmuch as it is commemorative of our Lord's passion, which was a true sacrifice. So you see that language of sacrifice coming up again. And in this respect, it is called a sacrifice. With regard to the present, it has another meaning, meaning mainly that of ecclesial unity, in which people are aggregated through this sacrament, and that would be Augustine's view. And in this respect, it is called communion. So when we call it Holy Communion, he thinks we're calling it the communion of the saints, right? It's really interesting. With regard to the future, it has a third meaning, inasmuch as the sacrament foreshadows the divine fruition, which shall come to pass in heaven. And according to this, it is called viaticum, which is provisions on the way. So it's feeding the pilgrims on their way to their goal which shall come to pass in heaven. Notice he hasn't yet called it Eucharist. And according to, um, let me see. And in this respect, it is also called the Eucharist. That is good grace, which is interesting because it really means thanksgiving. But he calls it good grace because of the way it would be translated into Latin. Because the grace of God is life everlasting. Or because it really contains Christ, who is full of grace. Right, so, so I find that really interesting in that you get the, the view of the Eucharist in the 1200s summarized right there. It has three different purposes, past, present, and future. And they're all, they're all one thing, but they're, they're distinct. Um, and then he goes on to say, the presence of Christ's true body and blood in the sacrament cannot be detected by sense, nor understanding, but by faith alone, which rests upon divine authority. So it's the fact that it, this is my body. So he's definitely going with that, right? Some men accordingly not paying heed to these things have contended that Christ's body and blood are not in this sacrament except as in a sign, a thing to be rejected as heretical since it is contrary to Christ's words. Hence, Baron Garrigus, who had been the first advisor of this heresy, not really, but anyway, was afterwards forced to withdraw his error and to acknowledge the truth of the faith. So you see immediately Baron Garrius is looming large here, uh, as well as Fourth, fourth Lateran. So then he goes on to endorse the Fourth Lateran Council. Uh, he didn't come up with this doctrine, so he's defending it. Uh, he says, since Christ's true body in the, is in the sacrament, and notice the localization is in the sacrament. That's what's so interesting. It's contained in the sacrament. Um, the true body is in the sacrament, and since it is not to begin there, to begin to be there by local motion, in other words, he doesn't come into it like a room, coming into a room, nor is it contained therein as in a place, like sitting in a room, it must be said then that it begins to be there by conversion of the substance of bread into itself. So it converts the substance of the bread. This would be Ambrose, right? Transfiguration, now it's transubstantiation. It converts the substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ. And, the, and it converts the substance of the wine 
into the substance of the blood of Christ. Yet this change is not like natural changes, and that again would be Ambrose, but is entirely supernatural and is affected by God's power alone. For the whole substance of the bread is changed into the whole substance of Christ's body, and the whole substance of the wine into the whole substance of Christ's blood. Hence, this is not a formal but a substantial conversion, nor is it of a, a kind of natural movement, but with a name of its own, it can be called transubstantiation. Right? So that that's an explanation which becomes very authoritative in its own way as to what transubstantiation means and what it doesn't mean. Right? Yeah. yeah. Very, uh, very Aristotelian. It's very Aristotelian, but it's very not Aristotelian because the thing that's not Aristotelian, and he knows this, is you never have for Aristotle accidents of something that, that that do not belong to the substance, right? So you don't have you don't have the appearance of an elephant and the reality of a human being, right? You could in metamorphoses, but that's another that's a whole bit, that's a whole bit of it. But you know what I mean? So so it's it's actually it's actually not Aristotelian in that you have to have a perpetual miracle holding the, the accidents, the appearance of bread and wine over the substance of body and blood, right? And so, so it, it's, it's phrased in Aristotelian language, but the substance of the doctrine, if you will, is very not Aristotle, because you, you can't have something substantially be a brick that looks like bread, you know? So, so the, the accidents go in here in the substance uh, for Aristotle. Um, and then he goes on to say why... Why the accidents remain, and one reason is it would be horrifying to eat somebody's body and blood, right? That's so something really interesting. And the second is that it, it, it saves the Eucharist from being mocked by unbelievers. And then the third is that it's an exercise of faith, so that we believe um, something we can't see. And he wrote a series of hymns, actually, for the Feast of Corpus Christi. And, one, and several of them are in the uh, in the Episcopal Hymnal, 1982. And the one you probably may have even heard is, uh, Humbly We Adore You, Verity Unseen. That's about the Eucharist, right? So the Verity Unseen, it's actually in Latin, it's Deity Unseen. And we're like, no, no, we're going to call it Verity Unseen. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, Patsy. It seems like to me that what we are responding to a draw, mm -hmm. the draw is from the risen Christ himself. Mm -hmm. That's God is drawing us. So, and all of the variations in things, you know, whether it's this or that or the other. In the end, for me, when I go to the Eucharist, I feel the draw. I move towards the draw uh, and let the draw become you. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your response and the ultimate response that I, when I was going through trying to understand the Eucharist now, the only thing that came up was that I don't know mm. okay <laughs> okay <laughs> that's probably the best answer right? I, don't <laughs> I don't know I don't know I don't know all of this stuff but I feel the draw mm -hmm. I respond to the drawing in myself mm -hmm. and hopefully I will Become. Become that to which you're drawing. With the draw. Right, right. No, that's beautifully said. And, and one of the things I mean, I have to stop now, but I'll, I'll pick up I'll pick up Aquinas on the sacrifice side on page two when we get to Luther after Easter, um, because that becomes a major point of contention whether the, the Eucharist is a sacrifice. But going to your point, it's very, very important to remember what I said at the beginning, and that is the word sacrament is the Latin translation of mysterium. Right, so what we're talking about is a mystery, and yet what happens is we start. We can't just leave things as a mystery. Yes, Can we do the second page. Yeah, we could look at that. Like, yeah, next time we meet, and just kind of push everything up. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah, so um, so we'll pick up we'll pick up the second page when we when we start again after Easter because we take two weeks off for Palm Sunday and Easter. But going back to that, one one of the things I I was talking to my wife about this. The church has a tendency to overdetermine mysteries, and they just can't let it be, and they have to say exactly what's going on. And one of the things that happens here, as well as in many other instances, I think, is a question of overdetermining. But on the other hand, you can see why. I mean, because for the people who really believe that Christ is present, 
bodily and his body and blood is truly present there. To question that just seems like you're just going to what Gates said about not bowing to the cross. You're evacuating the whole thing of all of its meaning. And so it's a, but I like what you said, that being drawn to the mystery and being transformed by it, that actually, that's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah, that does happen. Yeah. Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you again for coming. And we'll we'll pick up on the on the sacrament sacrifice discussion next time when we, when we get to uh, Martin Luther. So thank you again. Thank you.